Good morning, everyone. We ring our peace bowl this morning, first in joy, in Davis Hall, just on the other side of this office. I just greeted some people in person, and some people are here that I don't know. Welcome, welcome. We are happy that you are able to join our service today, and all of you who have been so faithful and gathered online all these 18 months. <laughs> Today, we affirm our collective hope for peace, and we acknowledge that these lands that we love are the ancestral lands of the Yavapai people, the Wipukepas, the Tolkepayas, the Kwevkepayas, and the Yavapai. In the early morning in Thailand, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka, while the world is still in darkness, monks rise from their pallets and go to the main temple for an hour of meditation, and then prepare to make the rounds with their begging bowls. The monks go out with their empty bowls, not certain of what they will receive, what will become their breakfast. Let us walk with them in Myanmar. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Granite Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Prescott, Arizona. I am Deidre Schwartz, your worship associate today. We extend a warm welcome to all. We're so happy you're able to join us and hope you are in good health. 
We wanna stay connected. So please join us for the breakout rooms after the service. If you're joining us for the first time, please visit our website for more information about us. That's prescottuu.org. This is the mission statement of our congregation. We are a compassionate spiritual community that celebrates diversity, nurtures the personal and spiritual growth of all ages, shares our gifts, promotes justice for all, and serves the world we live in. Although we are physically apart, we are still in community and we continue with some of our meetings and activities via the internet. So please continue to check the Weekly Peak, our website, the order of service, and Reverend Patty's videos for announcements. We do have a new faith development class starting this week, and there is important information about empty bowls. Please see the order, today's order of service for more information. We began our service in the Unitarian Universalist tradition of lighting the chalice. The chalice reading today is a chapter introduction called Interconnectedness. It's from the book, We Are What We Eat, A Slow Food Manifesto by Alice Waters. We think of ourselves as individuals acting on our own personal desires and impulses powered by our own unique wills. But while there is an individual quality to our experiences, we are also tied together, guided, affected, and supported by a large dynamic network operating all around us. When it comes to food, people who grow the food are connected to people who pick the food, who are connected to people who transport the food, who are connected to people who sell the food who are connected to people who cook the food, who are connected to people who eat the food, which is all of us. Once we understand the ways we are in interconnected to one another and to nature, a certain power is unleashed in us that naturally leads us to taking responsibility for our lives, one another, and the world. We light this chalice, a symbol of our heritage and gratitude for this beloved community. Thank you, Deidre, and welcome to everyone. Good morning. We gather this morning with our hearts full of the beauty of this morning, the deer that gather across from our house, my hope, I keep looking for that one deer who has a hurt leg and hoping that leg will heal. I am grateful each day for the trees that have enough water, the meadows that have fresh grass for the animals, and for the scent of the trees and those grasses that draw me out each morning, helped along by Louis's insistence. We are blessed each day. May the beauty that surrounds us urge us always to thanks. I invite you to say aloud, what are you thankful for today? And now for all those things, let us sing with the Granite Peak singers, we give thanks.
And now please join me in saying our covenant. Love is the doctrine of this congregation, the quest for truth its sacrament, and service is its prayer, to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community. Thus do we covenant together. And now before I ring our bell once again, and we find that place within us, that place of silence, I want to let you know that at the end of this service, we will be um, watching a video uh, and able you will have time to talk with people about um, our ideas about the new sanctuary where those cottage meetings have taken all of us so please stay um, and watch the video and talk with people and now as we take a breath together let us listen to the sound of this bowl Let us breathe together, find that place within us of silence. Let us feel our feet on this earth, this earth that has supported us all through our years. And let us consider what is beneath where our feet are touching, all those layers of earth down to its fiery core those layers always moving, always changing. And now I invite you to consider what is above you. Extend your spirit upwards into that brilliant blue sky and those ever-changing clouds of autumn up and up until you could touch the stars in a universe that stretches forever and is always moving, always changing. Each of us brings joys and sorrows to this place. We carry them sometimes even without knowing it. And in the silence of this place, I invite you to remember what you bring with you. We hold the people of Afghanistan and the essential workers, all those in hospitals that are becoming once again crowded, overcrowded with COVID patients. We hold those who died on that day 20 years ago that changed all of our lives. And we hold those who risked their lives to rescue people from the World Trade Center. This morning, we hold especially Karen Anderson, who is undergoing surgery in Phoenix. She is recovering well. She sent me a photo this morning, which I will not share, but she is recovering well. We hold all those whose names we say each week who are going through difficulties. We hold those two who are experiencing joy this day, let us begin our time of silence together with another deep breath. Let us think of the light, the wind in the trees. And now, after I ring the bowl, I invite you into a time of silence of two minutes. I invite you before we enter that silence to say the names of those who are on your hearts and minds. And after our silence, I will give a meditation prayer. Thank you. 
Gracious one, spirit of life, we are here again. Our hearts light with beauty, our love surrounding our community and extending into the world to which we are connected in marvelous and difficult ways. During the week when we are alone, may we remember this time of community of shared joys and sorrows and find comfort. May it be so. Amen. And now I invite you to join Lena and Russ in singing our song, Walking, Walking With You. This is the time in our service when we normally gather the offering. Let us embrace the feeling of connection and community that we have when we gather each week. Let us remember that this congregation and its programs are supported by your generosity. We also give back to the greater community through our Seeds of Support program. During the month of September, our recipient is the Arizona Family Health Partnership. Please read about them in your order of service and the newsletter. To give during this distance time, please go to prescottuu.org. On the bottom left-hand side, click the word donate to contribute. The link is also available in the chat on this video. What is given in love is received in gratitude. Blessed be.
Today, we are going to listen to a poem by Lao Tzu, who is an ancient Chinese philosopher and writer. He is the reputed author of the Tao Te Ching, which is a marvelous book full of wisdom. He's the founder of philosophical Taoism, and he wrote this poem. A bowl is most useful when it is empty. Today, we have reached the big day on Granite Peak UU Congregation's calendar, that day of empty bowls that follows months of bustling activity of bowl making and volunteer gathering. Hundreds of bowls are waiting, which usually would be filled with some wonderful soup from local restaurants. This year, 48 volunteers and two scout troops were prepared to join the efforts under the leadership of our congregation and the Prescott UU Fellowship. In this gathering, which many of you have attended, our children are excited to be able to take water around on a wagon to the people who are standing in the hot afternoon sun on the courthouse plaza. This is the day when so much energy is concentrating on that event called Empty Bowls, which helps to fund food banks throughout our area. But because of the danger of the new variants, and hospitals that are over their capacity, out of concern for the safety of the most vulnerable, and with respect to our Unitarian Universalist principles, the leadership made a courageous and very difficult choice to cancel the event. Now, some things are going to be done in a new way Items will be available online in a virtual Empty Bowls event. I hope that you participate. Three of Richard Moore's works of art, whose life we celebrated this past week, they're being auctioned with many other treasures. But these Empty Bowls that are so important to our congregation, what could they mean to us beyond this festival? Is there a way to transform the meaning into the something we consider each Sunday instead of this one Sunday a year? This year, the bowls are remaining empty with no chef to po poise to ladle in some delicious soup. Instead of that one soup, could an empty bowl hold the possibility of what it might be filled with, the possibility of abundance? In the video we, we saw at the beginning of this service, the Buddhist monks begin each morning with an empty bowl. They take off their shoes for the walk around the village or town or city to symbolize their humility in receiving and to symbolize that they are in the midst of what I believe to be a sacred act. Did you notice in the video that when a woman went to give to the monks, she took off her shoes, a sign of respect and of the humility and sacredness of giving. In the region where we lived in Japan, the priests didn't make the rounds each day. They only came around in the winter when the heavy, wet snow was deep on the roads, sometimes two meters deep. They wore their simple robes against that icy wind, and they had bare feet wearing straw sandals. They announced themselves when they entered our neighborhood with a drum and then, one at a time, they stopped before each house to drum, to get the attention of the occupants. 
The first winter, when we heard the sound of the drum, we didn't know what to do. We could see the priest peeking out as we peeked out from our second floor window. And not knowing what to do, we decided to play not at home. The priest must have guessed otherwise because he stood drumming, he stayed there. I suppose he didn't see our footprints in the snow coming out of our house. And he stood there for a long time before he finally walked away. That next week, our Japanese teacher explained that the priests were making their rounds, not for food, but for money. So the next winter, when we heard the sound, we ran around looking for money, but only found a few meager coins. We opened the door and we put those into the bowl he extended to us. We would try to keep a stash, maybe even a few bills for the next year. But when we told our Japanese teacher about our shameful offering, she told us that the offering was not for the priest. They didn't need the money, but by making the rounds, they were giving us a chance to give. The amount we gave was unimportant to them. The priest's empty bowl was an opportunity for us. In Jewish tradition, during Passover, at each table, there is an empty chair, an extra cup of juice, and one remaining piece of matzah. Jewish history tells of a beloved prophet by the name of Elijah, who appears in times of trouble to begin to bring promise of relief, to lift downcast spirits, and to plant hope in the hearts of the downtrodden. Wouldn't we love to have Elijah visit with those gifts? And the empty chair at the table symbolizes the possibility that someone new could join the circle. The opportunity is offered to the stranger. Our own dinner tables can become full up with the people we love. And this tradition is asking us to leave an empty place for the possibility of a human we have never met who could fill that place. And if that place were filled, the next year, we would need to add another empty chair, keep ourselves open to the possibility of strangers until our, our dining rooms were jammed with chairs. As humans, we have all lived on both sides of that metaphor. When we move to a new town, we long to find that empty chair around a table of new friends a chair that people could say was waiting just for us. I have experienced that unexpected miracle of welcome. When I first met Claire Whitaker in her 80s, in the 80s, sorry, she is in her 90s now, I knew her to be the mother of Mary Lou's former boyfriend, the one Mary Lou had dated right before she met me. Even after she couldn't have Mary Lou as a daughter-in-law, Claire opened her heart to Mary Lou and included her, wrote to her. And when we went to the States for visits from Japan, we stopped to see her and her husband Rod in Los Angeles. They were wonderful, funny, intelligent, full of stories. And I thought that they had made quite enough room for Mary Lou. It seemed enough that she had survived the breakup with a son and become a friend. It took me a long time, many visits, to realize that they had made plenty of room for me too. In 2013, when a brief window opened in New Mexico for same-sex marriage, Claire called Mary Lou and said, <clears throat> why don't you get married at my house? And so we did. 
in her living room in Santa Fe with loved ones and friends around us, Claire sitting with my sister Elizabeth, light all around them. When I look out at all of you and your hope of growing as a congregation, I hope for you that intention of making room in your heart, keeping a place within it empty for someone new. That is the way to grow. It begins with opening your circle that seems quite nice and full with old friends you've had for decades. It means honestly opening a place because we all know when people are offering a place that is a fake place that doesn't really exist. How did I come to know that Claire had a real place for me? First, she listened to me. She asked me questions and she really wanted to hear what I had to say about those questions, what I had on my heart. She wanted me to be in that chair at the table. I would have known if she hadn't. I was looking for the signs that she didn't want me at that table, as many are who come through our doors at Granite Peak. For close to 18 months, we have been enjoying breakout rooms. I know some of you leave right after the service, but you really must try a breakout room if you haven't. I love these because they epitomize that empty bowl or empty chair. You don't know whom or what ideas or wisdom you will receive. You are there to receive. I've heard of some wonderful friendships happening because you weren't able to talk with that person you usually would talk with if we were at our building. Next week, many of us are going to meet in person at Watson Lake. All of you who feel comfortable about this, I hope you come and bring your chair and bring your mask and bring some water, some water that symbolizes the gifts of this year. Come with ears that are ready to listen, even if it becomes a little more difficult as we are listening through our masks. This practice of the empty bowl is an important spiritual practice of opening ourselves to what we might receive and for being grateful for what comes. When there is no space for us, we know because we are not able to give the gifts we would love to give of our wisdom, our smiles, our laughter. I would love for you to consider each Sunday as an opportunity to take your bowl on the rounds and then return and look with wonder at what you have received. I hate returning home from a day and realizing that I went into a situation with my bowl chock full of stuff. Often it is because I think I am too busy or too tired, too many things already on my plate. Isn't that an interesting expression? And I am full of wonder when someone grabs me by my sleeve, gets my attention, and we sit together and feel that abundance of sharing. As Unitarian Universalists, we talk a lot about being allies to people who are experiencing injustice. I believe that a major part of that work is showing up with an empty bowl ready to listen, receive, be grateful to simply be in that place. In my new favorite book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, a botany ecology professor who is a member of the Potawatomi Nation, 
she writes of what we can give to Mother Earth in return for all that we receive. A first step in this reciprocity is to give her our attention, to enter our encounters with nature, as I hope to do each morning with Louis, enter that time with an empty bowl extended our feet bare in reverence and humility. Next week at our water communion ceremony at Watson Lake, we will have an opportunity to bring our full attention to that moment of receiving from the beauty around us and from each other. We will be able to welcome Clara Rose and the new members who have joined us since we began meeting online. Some you will only hear their names because of a big event that's happening that day. But I hope that you come, and I hope that you come with an empty bowl. May we intentionally experience the world with an empty bowl that is ready to receive May we meet others with hearts that have room for new possibilities of friendship, love, and ideas. For when a bowl is empty, it can become an instrument of peace. Amen, and may it be so. And let us sing together Love will guide us. give thanks for that choir that came to this parking lot and sang into the cold, cold months. I can feel the wind whistling around us. May we enter our relationships with one another intentionally, thinking of having empty places in our hearts let us think of carrying that empty bowl to one another. What wonders we are waiting to receive. Amen, and may it be so. And now you will see what um, that marvelous sanctuary transformation team has come up with after all their time listening in cottage meetings. I'm turning the time over now to that video of the Sanctuary Transformation Team. Hi, everyone. We're the Granite Peak Transformation Team and are happy to share with you the progress we've made so far. We hope that you understand that we're very appreciative of all of the input that all of you have given to our progress to this point. 
And we're especially grateful for your presence at one of the 15 cottage meetings that we held. At those meetings, over two thirds of the people gave us some very specific suggestions and recommendations that have been helpful. Uh, those ideas and opinions have brought us to the point where uh, we're ready to share this with you. Uh, we're now looking at a, uh, a enhanced and expanded version of what we shared that day, thanks to your input. And we are just about ready to share with you soon some uh, almost ready plans that the architect has drawn for us. We do look forward to everybody taking a look at what we've got so far because our long-term goal is to have a building that welcomes not only our beloved fellow uh, Granite Peak members and friends, but the entire community. And one that really kind of celebrates not only what we are, but who we are and our community. Of all the single elements mentioned by you, more asked for better lighting than any other thing. Uh, many said natural lighting, or brighter but less glaring than it is now. And to enhance the lighting, our architect has created a design which actually raises the sanctuary walls by four feet each, which will accommodate three three foot by eight foot windows on both sides, um, up higher than they are now. And as well, of course, as the altar window, the special one that will be above the altar which will be a little higher perhaps. Um, we've also learned of the existence of new low cost types of LED lighting, which we can place anywhere as guided by experts to have natural looking light and stage lighting as needed. As Lena indicated, the, the top um, desire of uh, in the feedbacks from the cottage meetings was more natural light. The second, in fact, was improved acoustics. Uh, there are really two aspects of the acoustics. One is from the point of view of the performers, the singers, the choir, and the other is listeners. And this new design takes uh, considerable account uh, to, or to considerable effort to improve the acoustics of the, of the facility. For one, the higher walls will uh, basically open the room up. There will be a uh, a much simpler pitch ceiling, unlike the incredible collection of trusses that would be exposed if we simply removed the acoustical tiles, which are such a problem, the acoustical tiles and the very flat, long structure of the building really makes for uh, acoustics horrible. As a choir singer, I can tell you, and so can Russ, uh, and so can Lena, Tell you, you can't hardly hear the person standing next to you. And I know as someone listening that it's very hard to hear, particularly without a lot of electronic amplification. So this new design uh, has a lot of features that should improve the acoustics and make it a much more satisfying live uh, venue. And hopefully uh, musicians in Prescott may love to come in and play. The third most commonly expressed concern that came out of our many cottage meetings was the condition of the current flooring. Many congregants expressed the desire to see an upgrade here. The committee discussed a variety of solutions from carpeting to tile to engineered wood, laminate flooring, or some combination of surfaces. After we researched the costs and the effects on the seating arrangements, and most importantly, what the effect would be on the acoustic goals of our transformation of the sanctuary, it became clear that carpet squares made with low or zero VOCs, that's volatile organic compounds, was the safest and the best choice. Carpet squares are durable, they're attractive, they offer a variety of choices in styles and colors, plus, if any of the carpet squares get damaged, individual squares can easily be replaced and very economically replaced. These plans for lighting, acoustics, and flooring will create a more spiritual and aesthetically appealing sanctuary. 
Many other of your hopes, ideas, concerns, and worries have also been factored into our deliberations. The cottage, the cottage meetings revealed that the congregation is as overwhelmingly excited and hopeful about this project as we are. The Sanctuary Transformation Team consists of Rick Denny, Russ Erickson, Peter Eldridge, Bonnie Fort, Fred Fort, Lena Huben, Fred Kraps, Stephen Lovejoy, Dan Reardon, Ray Shearer, Kathleen Schaefer, Joe Sprague, Dick Walter, and Patty Willis. Thank you for your time and support. Well, I wonder if you have any questions, because if you do, you just stay after in the main room. Don't go in that marvelous um, uh, breakout rooms, but stay in the main room and uh, Rick Denny and Russ Erickson and other members will be there as well, but they're going to be the main ones answering questions. Okay, so let us um, extinguish our chalice together now. We extinguish this flame, but not the right light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I hope to see many of you at Watson Lake next week. And um, remember to bring um, a water that symbolizes um, your gift to the community. And, um, and we may have some bowls there. Hmm. Um, so stay tuned for that. Now let's, uh, we'll be just staying in this main room and answering questions. <laughs> 